Hello, welcome to Zoonosis with Joy. I'm Joy, and today we're going to be talking about thoroughbred racehorses. Let's get started. So to begin with, a thoroughbred racehorse is specifically a horse um, that is part of the thoroughbred breed that is used specifically for racing. There are many different races, of course, you think about the Kentucky Derby, but there are other ones as well. Um, thoroughbred is a specific breed of horse, and it's actually a very narrow definition of, of breed. Um, so it comes from the 18th century, 17th century UK, and all thoroughbred racehorses that are alive today are descended from only three foundational sires. So the names of those stallions are the Burley Turk, the Darcy Arabian, and the Godolphin Arabian. There was also foundational mares as well. Their origins were a bit more cosmopolitan, shall we say. So some of them were Arabian, some were uh, Turks, some were native to Ireland, some were native to the UK, uh, you know, England. Uh, so there was quite a diverse initial genetic grouping there. However, since the late 18th century, that stud book has been closed, meaning that you can't bring any new genetics into the breed. I mean, you could definitely breed horses that are thoroughbred with other horses, but they wouldn't be thoroughbreds anymore. They wouldn't be included in the breed. They would be therefore hybrids and they wouldn't be allowed to do the racing and the exclusive kinds of things like the Kentucky Derby or other kinds of derby races that are only for thoroughbred racehorses. So a very, very narrow definition of a breed. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of money in racehorses. So imagine what would happen if you let all the geneticists loosed on this kind of inbred small population with lots and lots of money at stake. Now, we'll find some interesting things for sure. So some of the things that they found is that racehorses of today have had a strong selective pressure for some interesting mutations that make them better racers. One of them is a mutation in the myostatin gene. Now, as the name implies, myostatin stops the growth of muscles. Statin means stop, myo means muscle, right? You've probably seen pictures online of the double muscle whippets. Um, so these are dogs that have a double mutation for the myostatin gene. So they get, you know, both their parents are carriers or, you know, they're both, um, you know, both of the parents have the carriers for the gene, and that means the individuals that have a double copy of this gene get double muscling. So their muscles don't stop normally, and they get very, very bulky, and they grow very, very quickly. The racehorses of today have a very similar gene in the thoroughbred line. Really, this started off in the mid-20th century. It's actually a relatively recent um, evolutionary trend in the breed. Part of the reason for that is that in the 19th century, they used to do races in heats and they would have longer races and horses were only allowed to race if they were about five or six years old. Nowadays, there's much more short sprint races and the horses are much younger. So there's been a very strong selective pressure for horses that run really fast, that grow up really quickly and have a lot of muscle. So horses in the thoroughbred breed often have the C allele for myostatin. In fact, most of them do now. And the reason for that is because of the horse Northern Dancer, a Canadian horse, ha ha. So the Canadian horse Northern Dancer contributed this gene and helped change the entire evolutionary trajectory of the uh, thoroughbred breed. Now, the sword cuts both ways. When you have a small population like this, inbreeding is a huge problem. Everybody's related to everybody else. There's just, you know, it's cousins dating, you know, sweet home Alabama kind of stuff going on. With thoroughbreds, one of the big risks for that is if you get two carriers of a disease gene and it's a silent mutation, if those two carriers breed, they have a 25% chance of producing an individual who has the disease. Now, if you think about it, you multiply that by the number of times you breed carriers together and suddenly you have a huge population of these horses that are too inbred and they have their homozygous, meaning have two of the copies of the recessive disease gene. Let's talk a little less abstractly. This means that horses uh, that are double negative for a very specific gene, it's a string of letters and numbers geneticists, you need to name things better. I'm gonna put it up here so that you guys can know what gene it is. It's responsible for the repair and growth of cartilage. This means that horses that have a defective copy of this gene will, well, defect two defective copies of this gene, won't be able to repair their cartilage normally, and they'll have a lower chance of ever racing in their entire lives, something like 
33% less, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, so it's a huge important thing. If you raise the inbreeding coefficient of horses by 10%, there is a 7% increase in the chance that the horse will never race in their entire life. So you have to be very careful when you're breeding these horses together because you know you have all these desirable genes, but you also have all these negative genes. And they come in one package, right? You can't just pick and choose. I mean, now you can with CRISPR-Cas9, but they're not gonna allow that for thoroughbreds. So, you know, there you go. They all, they all have to be born through natural service A. You know, they don't use AI. They don't use artificial selection or artificial implantation. And they certainly don't use CRISPR-Cas9. So, a lot of fun things about racehorses right there. But genetics aren't any, everything, you know? Um, you think about horses like Secretariat. And it's been 50 years since Secretariat won the Triple Crown, set records in every single one of those events that I don't remember. Um, and those records still are unbroken to this day. The success was not because of the genetics of Secretariat. I mean, a lot of horses are descended from Secretariat. He was a stud horse. What this tells us is that there's a lot of individual variation. Now, I'm gonna link an article to the veterinarian that actually did the necropsy of Secretariat. It's not a normal necropsy where they, you know, we disassemble the whole animal, look at every single organ, submit it for histopathology like we do nowadays. It was much more emotional. Um, they really knew what killed this horse and the veterinarian was very, um, you know, had a lot of emotional attachment to this horse as a lot of people did. Secretariat was a very influential horse. People really like Secretariat. So someone suggested, you know, Secretariat's known for having a big heart. Why don't we take a look at the heart? And the veterinarian's like, okay. So yeah, here it goes in with the bolt cutters to open up the chest wall to look at this heart. Now a normal thoroughbred heart is, you know, eight, nine pounds somewhere in there. The Secretariat's heart was like 22 pounds, big, massive thing and no signs of any sort of disease in that heart, very healthy. This meant that Secretariat could pump a lot more blood and you know be a lot more athletic than any other horse of his kind. And this seems to be an anomaly, developmentally speaking, had no genetic basis whatsoever. Secretariat's success was all his own, really. Um, I mean, he had a lot of good genetics, and you know, how good are the genetics in a breed where everyone's related to everyone else, and you know, everyone's carrying the same set of good and bad genes, Probably not that much. Training counts for a lot more. Individual variations that were not genetically related probably too. Um, you know, one thing I will link in here is that there's a fair amount of horse doping and that's actually gotten worse and worse as more and more money stacks up in favor of the horses uh, to win. Um, there's a lot of pressure by trainers to you know get the competitive edge, the boost, um, and that's why they do lots of mandatory drug testing. So the big point of this, the big takeaway I want you to have for this is that Genetics aren't everything. And certainly in a breed this small, where everyone's related to everyone else and everyone, you know, cousins to everyone else, the genetic differences basically don't matter. <laughs> um, I mean, there's obviously differences to which horses in, on the individual level, but it kind of evens out really in the end. So, it, you know, training is important and individual um, differences are important that aren't genetically related. That's all I really wanted to say, short video for this time. This might be my last horse video for a while because my horse course is happening in about a month and I'll be focusing on that. I'll probably be making more videos about small animals. Um, someone's been asking me to do a video about the uh, service animals, which I'll probably do next week or the week after, but stay tuned. And uh, if you have any questions or you know if you thought I got something egregiously wrong in this video or any one of my videos, I love feedback and I try to do better each time. Um, so leave it in the comments or send me a DM or whatever. And um, yeah, I'm on Twitter as well. So you can yell at me and argue with me on Twitter. I don't know how long I'll be on there for, but anyway, all that besides, have a good one. Peace.